And now, without any further comments, let's listen to what Chilton had to say about the passing of the old heavens and earth at the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. There are scripture passages that indicate that the world isn't going to end in a fiery holocaust. It's going to um, continue on forever. And uh, scripture references for those, if you want to jot them down, Psalm 78, verse 69, Psalm 104, verse 5, Psalm 119, 90, Ecclesiastes 1, 4, and Ephesians 3, 21. And that gave me the idea to share with you. Like I said, if you don't get anything else out of this, this will be kind of fun. Do you all know who Jack Van Impey is? Jack and Rickzella Van Impey. Well, well, they're not preterists. <laughs> but I watch him every Sunday night, just for fun. And uh, so I, I wrote this letter to him last December because I was watching their show and it occurred to me, wait, I, I ought to really ask them this question. I have a question for you. That seems to me is completely impossible to answer from a dispensational, premillennial, literalist standpoint. It has to do with Christ's statement in Matthew 24, 29 to 30, which reads, Christ speaking, Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and a star shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Connect this with Revelation 6, 12 to 17, which speaks of the same thermonuclear event. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell onto the earth. Imagine that. Stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were removed out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sits us on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come, and who shall be able to stand? My question is, what rocks? The whole Milky Way galaxy has just collapsed on the earth, okay? And at that point, everybody gets in there, oh, let's run to the rocks and the mountains. So my question is, what rocks? What mountains? If the entire universe has just exploded and evaporated in a cataclysm that caused not only the solar system, but at least the Milky Way galaxy to disappear, how can anyone be left? And in what dens and rocks in the mountains would he be able to hide? Sincerely, David Tilton. Well, I didn't get an answer to that. <laughs> Big surprise. But that's to introduce the fact that the passing of heaven and earth that the Bible speaks about is not ever literally the passing away of the literal gravel, sand, rock, heaven and earth. It has nothing to do with that. In Second Peter chapter 3, I'll read verses 1 through 4. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the Holy Prophet, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So remember what Christ said, remember what we said, knowing this, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking after their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. So he reminds them that there's going to be the apostasy coming in the last days. Uh, you can connect this for just a minute to, to the book of Jude. Jude. Jude is really kind of a sad book. Jude planned to write a great systematic theology. Imagine a systematic theology by Jude. He says so in verse 3. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, so he was planning on this, the great magnum opus of, of St. Jude, okay? Unfortunately, it never got, well, if it did get written, it didn't make it into the Bible. While I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to condemn earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny the only Lord God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
And then he goes on and talks about this great apostasy that's coming. So Judas planning to write his great systematic theology, and uh uh-oh, this emergency comes up in the churches. The churches are starting to get distracted by all these heretics and apostates. And so he says, wait, wait, forget forget that my great plan. What I need to do is warn you about what's coming. And so he continues in verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words which are spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the same thing Peter's saying. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own lust. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. What he's saying is, remember, this emergency is coming up, and therefore I have to give you this message about what's happening in the last days. The last days are not the last days of the physical universe. They're not any time in our future. They were last days that were going on right then. Otherwise, why would he be warning them about something that's going to happen in the last days, but actually it won't happen for, well, at least till 1997, okay? That's not his point. His point is that it's happening right now. The tone of imminence it runs all the way through the New Testament. So he warns them about this, this apostasy that's going to be taking place in the last days. He talks about these mockers who were what I call covenant apostates. They were Jews who had abandoned the covenant by rejecting Christ. Jesus had repeatedly warned of God's wrath um, in such passages as Matthew 12, 38 to 45, Matthew 16, 1 through 4, Matthew 23 and 24, and um, here in Second Peter, he continues this. I'll read verse 5 through 7. For this they willfully forget that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heaven and earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. The heaven and earth which now exist he does not mean the literal gravel that's on the earth. He does not mean that. Heaven and earth is language that goes back to the Old Testament about the way God spoke of Israel. So Peter is saying as the flood destroyed the world uh, of of Noah, so the world of Israel will, will be destroyed by fire. The destruction of the present heavens and earth is going to make way, he says, for a new heavens and earth. And then verse 10, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with the great noise. And the elements, remember that word, soikeia, and the elements will melt with firm and heat, both the earth, or that should be translated, both the land, that would make it easier for us to understand, because he's talking about the land of Israel, not, not earth, not soil. He's not talking about the earth that's in Hawaii or, you know, anywhere else. He's talking about the earth, meaning the land of Israel. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Now, there's what I call um, in my book, Paradise of Sword and, and Days of Vengeance, collapsing universe terminology. It, it sounds like the whole universe is coming apart. It, it, the whole universe is collapsing. But what that indicates is the dissolution and destruction of the Old Covenant world order. In Isaiah 51, verse 15 and 16, God says, I am the Lord thy God that divides the sea whose waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. And I have put my words in thy mouth, and I have covered thee in the shadow of mine hand, that I may plant the heavens, and lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, Thou art my people. What God was saying was, Israel had been a, a new creation. The original new creation, don't, don't think of the, the new creation as, as just the new covenant. We're the second new creation. The original new creation it was when God created Israel, when God uh, set apart Israel as his special people and created them to be his people. John Owen, my favorite Puritan, um, lived in the, toward the end of the 17th century, wrote about this. So this is not, don't get the idea that this is some newfangled idea that just popped up out of somebody's formerly coming his brain. Um, this goes centuries back People, Bible scholars for, for centuries have known that what the Bible is talking about here is not literal destruction of heaven and earth, but actually the destruction of the old covenant heaven and earth. Uh, John Owen writes about this text in Isaiah, 
um, where, where God says that He's going to plant the heavens, lay the foundations of the earth, and say to Zion, Now are my people. John Owen, this Puritan, wrote, The time when the work here mentioned of planting the heavens and laying the foundation of the earth was performed by God was when He divided the sea, Isaiah 51, 15, and gave the law, verse 16, and said to Zion, Thou art my people. That is, when he took the children of Israel out of Egypt and formed them in the wilderness into a church and state. Then he planted the heavens and laid the foundations of the earth, made the new world, that is, brought forth order and government and beauty from the confusion wherein before they were. This is the planting of the heavens and laying the foundation of the earth in the world. And hence it is that when mention is made of the destruction of the state or government, it is in that language that seems to set forth the end of the world. For example, Isaiah 34, verse 4, um, which talks about it, uh, it seems like the whole universe is coming apart, and actually it's talking about something that happened hundreds of years B.C., the destruction of, of the state of Edom. In our Savior Christ's prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem in Matthew 24, he sets it out by expressions of the same importance. It is evident, then, that in the prophetical idiom and manner of speech, by heavens and earth, the civil and religious state and combination of men in the world and the men of them are often understood. So were the heavens and earth of that world that were destroyed by the flood. So what Owen is pointing out is there's a metaphorical usage of the terms heaven and earth. The same goes with the collapsing universe terminology that is used in Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 23 to 31, but I'll just read a little bit of it. So Jeremiah is speaking in similar language of decreation. He quotes, I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void. What does that sound familiar to us, right? The earth was formless and void. Well, he's not talking about the original earth. He's talking about something that's going to happen to this earth, meaning Israel. I looked on the earth, and behold, it was formless and void, and to the heavens, and they had no light. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, referring to the curse of, of uh, Leviticus 26. Yet I will not execute a complete destruction. For this the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above be dark. He's not talking about literally the universe blowing up or coming apart. He's talking about the destruction of the present heavens and earth, the new creation of Israel. Remember, in Exodus 15, verse 17, you can look this up, but when God brought Israel through the Red Sea, he was symbolically recreating heaven and earth. That's why the same kind of things happen. Think about it. God divided the light from the darkness. He divided the water from the waters. The dry land appeared, and he planted his people on his holy mountain in that dry land, just like he had done with Noah. He planted his people in the holy mountain. What God was doing by those symbols was, it was like a redemptive recapitulation of the making of heaven and earth. So a new heaven and earth was created when God created the state of Israel in the crossing of the Red Sea. The waters parted from the waters, and dry land appeared, and God's people were living in paradise again. In the Old Covenant, the world was organized around the temple, and that was signified the present heavens and earth. Let me um, quote from a great expositor of the century ago named John Brown. By the way, I'll pay good money if anybody can find me a copy of his book on Galatians, because it's a wonderful one. I had it years ago, and it made me at least a partial preterist over 20 years ago. I date my um, move toward preterism, I think, from reading John Brown's commentary on Galatians at all things. John Brown wrote in his book, Discourses and Sayings of Our Lord, a person not at all familiar with the phraseology of the Old Testament scriptures knows that the dissolution of the Mosaic economy and the establishment of the Christian is often spoken of as the removing of the old earth and heaven and the creation of a new earth and heaven. The period of the close of one dispensation and the com commencement of the other is spoken of as the last days and as the end of the world, and is described as a shaking of the earth and heavens that should lead to the removal of things which are shaken. The Agai 2, 6, and Hebrews 12, 26, and 27. So back to John Owen, this expositor of, of three centuries ago. John Owen said, On this foundation I affirm that the heavens and earth intend this prophecy of Peter, the coming of the Lord, the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men, mention the destruction of that heaven and earth, do all of them relate, not to the final and last judgment of the world, but to that utter desolation and destruction that was made of the Judaical church and state, the fall of Jerusalem in A.D. 70. 
John Owen is a Preterist expositor over three centuries ago. Now, back to um, 2 Peter 3, verse 10. I'll re- just read verse 10 12. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will... Remember that word elements. That's the not literal sand, rock, gravel. That's talking about the elements of the old covenant system, the sacrificial system and so forth. That's the way that word is used throughout the New Testament without exception. The elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it shall be burned up. So the land shall be burned up. Therefore, since all these things, your translation probably says, will be dissolved. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. That's not what it says. Okay? Since all these things are being dissolved. What's wrong with Peter? He's got his eschatology wrong. He doesn't have any idea that this is supposed to happen a couple thousand years from now, he says. I mean, Tim, he thinks it's going to happen soon. What a dumb idea. Well, the problem is, we're faced with the dilemma, do we believe the Bible or people's opinions today? Do we go to the Bible to find out its own terms and its own language and, and discover what it means in, in its own language, or do we just um, come up with our own imagination? I was reading Second Peter three eleven. Therefore, since all these things are being dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy kindness and godliness? Well, hey, Peter... Who cares? Because I'm not going to live to see this stuff. Why should I care, living in the first century world, why should I give a, a whip if this destruction is going to happen in, in, you know, the 20th century or 21st by now? I mean, coming soon, I guess. So, <laughs> aren't you going to be so glad when we get past that magic year 2000? I mean, I think a lot of this craziness is going to disappear by then. But he says, our being dissolved. What manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct of godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements are being melted with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Peter is saying in the first century, we are looking for the new heavens and new earth. That's going to happen soon. Looking for and hastening, it's going to happen. I mean, Obviously, if it didn't happen, he's certainly giving his readers a false impression. All the people that read Second Peter in the first century, imagine that. You're living in a church in the first century and you're reading this and you're saying, oh my God, this is going to happen soon. i got to do something. Okay? What do I got to do? He says, well, get busy with being righteous. Then verse 14, I mean, he's just rubbing our noses in it. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. So Peter is using the nearness of the judgment as a motive to godly living. And again, Peter is using the same terms as, as the Apostle Paul. That's an important point. Now, one objection to all this is, well, that doesn't count because verse 8 says, Beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is one day. Which means that, well, some people say, well, God's arithmetic is different from ours. That means that he can say it's going to happen soon. It really means in a couple thousand years. Uh, let me quote Milton Terry. He says, The language is a poetical citation of Psalm 90 and is adduced to show that the lapse of time did not invalidate the promise of God. But this is very different from saying that when the everlasting God promises something shortly and declares that it is close at hand, he may mean that it is thousands of years in the future. Whatever he has promised indefinitely, he may take a thousand years or more to fulfill. But what he affirms to be at the door, let no man de- declare to be far away. J. Stuart Russell wrote a great book called The Parousia, and he says this about that text, about the day of the Lord is a thousand years. Few passages have suffered more from misconstruction than this, which has been made to speak a language inconsistent with its obvious intention, as, and even incompatible with the strict regard to veracity. That's an old-fashioned word for truth. It is not unusual to quote these words, he says for people, to quote these words as an argument or excuse for the total disregard for the element of time in the prophetic writing. Even in cases where a certain time is specified in the prediction, or where such limitations as shortly or speedily or at hand are expressed, 
that before us is appealed to in justification of an arbitrary treatment of such notes of time, so that soon may mean late, and near may mean distant, and short may mean long, and vice versa. It is surely unnecessary, well, sorry, Russell, but it is necessary. He says, it is surely unnecessary to repudiate in the strongest manner such a non-natural method of interpreting the language of scripture. It is worse than ungrammatical and unreasonable. It is immoral. Okay? He's getting serious about this. We're toying with the word of God if, if we treat it that way. This is not a joke. It is immoral. It is to suggest that God has two ways and measures in his dealings with man, and that it is his mode of reckoning there is an ambiguity and a variableness which will make it impossible to tell what manner of time the Spirit of Christ and the prophets may signify, First Peter 1.11. The scriptures themselves, however, give no countenance to such method of interpretation. Faithfulness is one of the attributes most frequently ascribed to the covenant-keeping God, and the divine faithfulness is that which the apostle in this very passage affirms. The apostle does not say that when the Lord promises a thing for today, he may not fulfill his promise for a thousand years. That would be slackness. That would be a breach of promise. He does not say that because God is infinite and everlasting, therefore he reckons with a different arithmetic from ours, or speaks to us in a double sense, and uses two different ways and measures in his dealings with mankind, the very reverse is the truth. It is evident that the object of the apostle in this passage is to give his readers the strongest assurance that the impending catastrophe of the last days were on the very eve of fulfillment. The veracity and faithfulness of God were the guarantees of the punctual performance of the promise. To have intimated that time was a variable quantity in the promise of God would have been to stultify and neutralize his own teaching, which was that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. So Peter says in verse 13, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Like I, I was quoting from John Owen before. John Owen says, According to its promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. And then Owen asked a question nobody asked. I mean, whenever the Bible quotes or refers to an Old Testament passage, go back and look it up. Owen says, according to its promise, we are looking for new heavens and new earth in which righteousness dwells. Owen asks, where is that promise? Where can we find it? Where in the Bible does it promise a new heavens and new earth? And Owen points out, where is that promise? Where may we find it? Why we have it in the very words and letter, Isaiah 65, 17. Now when shall this be that God will create this new heavens and new earth, when the world writes So Peter, it shall be after the coming of the Lord, after that judgment and destruction of ungodly men who obey God, not the gospel. From which is now evident from this passage of Isaiah with chapter 66, 21 and 22, it is a prophecy of gospel times only. That means he's talking about New Testament. It's a prophecy of the last days that were occurring in the New Testament times. Gospel times only. And the planting of those, these heavens and earth is nothing but the creation of gospel ordinances to endure forever. The same thing is so expressed in Hebrews 12, 26 to 28. He's pointing out that the only place Peter is saying that the new heavens and new earth are prophesied in Scripture. Well, where is it prophesied in Scripture? The only one place, Isaiah 65 and 66. Well, you go back to Isaiah 65 and 66. You read Isaiah 65, uh, 17 through 21 or so, and you will see it can't possibly be... I mean, I, I have a copy of the New Geneva Study Bible. You know what that is? It says, this is obviously a, a picture of the eternal state. Not possible, not possible. No way. Because you know what? In that passage, Isaiah talks about people will be getting old and dying. People will be giving birth. They'll be building and planting. All kinds of normal, everyday activities going on in the new heavens and new earth. How is that going to happen? In the eternal state, we're still going to be dying. In the eternal state, we're going to be building houses and giving birth. I mean, what kind of weird eschatology is that? That gets really weird if you got to start thinking about people are going to be having babies in the new heaven and new earth, if that's eternal state. So, weird theology. But anyway, according to Isaiah, the new creation isn't the eternal state. It's the period of the gospel triumph when my, mankind comes to bow before the Lord. 
Peter tells the first century church to be patient, to wait for God's judgment to destroy the oppressors. He says, 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. You ought to see the New Zealand Study Bible on that one. <laughs> um, the point is, when God destroyed the Old Covenant, the New Covenant temple was left in its place, and it marches on to victory. The world will be converted. The earth's treasure will be brought into the city of God. According to the apostles, the age of consummation that already begun with the resurrection and ascension of Christ and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Paul talks about the same thing that John talks about in different language. John foresees a new creation, a new heavens and earth. Well, what does Paul say in 2 Corinthians 5.21? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. It's like he's quoting from Revelation chapter 21. The New Jerusalem is not a space station. Now, I mean, I've read Bible commentaries that say that it is. One, one commentator says, according to Revelation 21, that proves that even now, right now, there is a great city being built, and he says, far out in space somewhere. Okay, maybe that's true. You know, a few years ago, they sent a Mars probe. The Mars probe disappeared. I figured, well, if the New Jerusalem is on its way down, maybe the Mars probe just disappeared. Now it's a hood ornament. <laughs> so, I know what happened to the Mars probe. It's a hood ornament on the descending New Jerusalem. No, 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 no. But as the old heaven and earth collapsed, the church was receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken. Was receiving, Paul says in Hebrews. What we are receiving, not, not that someday we're going to receive it, but we are receiving, but they hadn't quite received it yet. Okay, it was a process. Um, Peter was pointing to things that were already happening. Let me just read verse 14 and following. Therefore, beloved, looking forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless. Actually, you first century Christians don't need to worry about that at all because it's not going to happen for thousands of years. No, he says, be diligent, look forward to these things. And the count of the long suffering of, of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, has also written to you in all of the epistles, speaking of them of these things. Well, wait a minute. Where did Paul speak of these things? Where did Paul speak about the stoicheia of the old covenant coming apart? There are only three places. In Galatians 4 and Colossians 2 and Hebrews chapter 5. That's the only place where that term shows up. I don't want to write a book on this, but what I'm going to do is catch people by surprise. I'm going to take them through Galatians and Colossians and Hebrews and say, isn't it wonderful that we all agree? I mean, here's something all Christians agree on. The old covenant is gone. If you wanted to, you couldn't go back and sacrifice. So the old covenant is gone. We're liberated from that. And then pull the plug in Second Peter and say, hey, Peter's just talking about the same thing. So Paul is talking about the dissolving of, of the stoiche of the old covenant. What Peter's saying is that once the old era is gone, the new covenant will be established an era in which righteousness dwells. Some of you know my um, sort of gradual movement into full preterist position, and um, I recently ran across a passage in Paradise Restored that now I look at it and think, that should have pushed me over the cliff 12 years ago into full preterism. I don't know why it didn't. I don't know what I would have done if somebody had come to me and said, David Chilton, look at what you said. So, but anyway, that's another story. What I'm getting at is, um, here I am as a full preterist, but also, um, and forgive me if some of you aren't this, maybe many of you aren't this, and, and you'll be shocked that if I'm a full preterist, how in the world I can be a theonomist. But bear with me for this point. One reason, at least one reason why the Reformed, especially the, the theonomic, biblical law-oriented, Rush Dooney, Gary North, that camp, feels that they can't come into preterism is because of this very clear issue. Because much of theonomy, much of the argument for theonomy is based upon a certain interpretation of Matthew 5, 17 through 19, which you can turn to, I'll get there in a minute. But that's a crucial text. It's very important. And how you interpret that text determines an awful lot about a lot of things. But let me quote first from Greg Bonson's book. Greg Bonson died last year, um, but he was 
uh, until then, people considered at least the premier theologian for the theonomic worldview. But Bonson makes this statement on page 213 of his book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics. He makes five points, the five points of theonomy. His main argument is this. Number one, the Christian is morally obligated to observe every jot and tittle of the Old Testament law. To disobey any point is to violate the whole law, James 2.10. Number two, there is a system or interrelated set of ceremonial laws. Number three, the observation of this system of ordinances, redemptive ceremonies, was intended to be superseded. It was a foreshadow of Christ's saving economy and has become obsolete with his historical work. We all would agree with that, right? But let me say it again. The observation of this system of ordinances, redemptive ceremonies, was intended to be superseded. It was a foreshadow of Christ's saving economy and has become obsolete with his historical work. So the system of ceremonies, the Old Covenant, has become obsolete now in the New Covenant. You don't feel under any obligation to go perform a sacrifice. If you did feel under obligation to perform a sacrifice, you're in more than hot water, because you can't. The most dedicated, pharisaical Jew in the world cannot perform the sacrifice. The temple is gone. For almost 2,000 years it's been gone. So, anyway, the old covenant, the old, the old system of ceremonies has become obsolete with Christ's saving work. And I think almost every Christian would agree with that statement. Thus, number four, the continued observation of this system of shadows is to miss their true import, is diametrically opposed to Christian faith, and evidences condemning bondage. Galatians 4 and 5. Therefore, number five, in order to walk righteously before our God and not violate his requirements at any point, we must identify and distinguish ceremonial observance from moral observance. What Bonson is saying is, look, God gave a system of laws. There are ceremonial laws and there are moral laws. The ceremonial laws are gone with the passing of the Old Covenant. The moral laws still exist. Now, you may have ways you want to finesse that, but the fact is, virtually every Christian would agree with that statement as it stands, like I said, you might want to finesse, okay? That's the basic theonomic argument. Let me just summarize. Number one, the Old Testament law consists of ceremonial and moral laws. Number two, Old Testament ceremonial laws were typological of Christ, and he brought a change in the law. Number three, Old Testament moral laws are confirmed in the New Testament as still binding. God is still God. God says, I am the Lord, I change not. James 1.17, with him there is no variation or shadow of turning. So God doesn't change his standards of what he thinks right and wrong are. Now, you may not agree with God's opinion, but good news. God's God, you're not, okay? So God says certain things are right and wrong. The moral law is still there. A recent writer named William N. Weicker has written a little book called um, Ethics and God's Law, an Introduction to Theonomy, which is a good um, summary statement of, of the basic theonomic argument, Bonson's argument. And let me quote from what he says on page 29 of his Introduction to Theonomy. He says, Secondly, Jesus Christ himself emphatically taught the continuing authority of the moral precepts of the Old Testament law for his kingdom when he said, quote, from Matthew 5, 17 through 19, Think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say to you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, and te shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And N. Weicker continues with this significant summary statement. Jesus here declares that his disciples are responsible to do and teach the ethical and moral principles contained in the law and the prophets. Not true. That is not what Jesus said. Let me read that statement again. Jesus here declares that his disciples, meaning us, modern day Christians, are responsible to do and teach the ethical and moral principles contained in the Law and the Prophets. That is not what Jesus said. He said, 
jot and tittle. Unless you observe all the jot and tittle, the jot and tittle don't pass away till all is fulfilled. Enwiker says, now let me get to some quotations from Greg Bonson. And Bonson says that our duty now is to observe the ethical and moral principles of the Old Testament law. Amen. I agree with that. I don't know where you are all that, but I agree with that. But that's not what the text says. Bonson says more than that. Let me quote from Bonson's own book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, page 73 and 74. Quote, It is the point of slightness that Jesus brings forcefully before us. Not even the very least extensive number of the very least significant aspects of the Older Testament law will become invalid till heaven and earth pass away. It is hard to imagine how Jesus could have more intensely affirmed that every bit, and he italicizes that, okay? So that's why I jumped, okay? Every bit of the old law remains binding in the gospel age. Every bit. Back to Enwiker. What did Enwiker say? The moral precepts. Jesus declared that his disciples were responsible to do and teach the ethical and moral principles contained in the law and the Sabbath. That's not what Bonson says. Bonson says every bit. Well, for one thing, that means that the jot and tittle aren't broad, vague principles. In fact, let me quote that from Bonson's book, page 74 of Theonomy and Christian Ethics. Jot and tittle are not broad, vague principles. They're jots and tittles. They're every little insignificant, picky-uni, pharisaical detail, legalistic detail, Getting down to the jots and tittles, I mean, that's really teasy weasy bit of the Old Testament law are fully valid in this age. I wrote a letter to a friend recently. I said, as Hamlet says, "'Tis the sport out the engineer hoist with his own petard." But what it means is, if what Bonson says is true, that means the entire Christian church has been violating God's law for almost 2,000 years. When push comes to shove, he cheats at a crucial point. And the crucial point is Hebrews 8.13. So turn to Hebrews 8.13. You can camp out on that for the rest of the time here. I know I, I'm getting a second, Peter, but I'll get there. So Hebrews 8.13. Bonson, four times in his book, Theonomy and Christian Ethics, cites Hebrews 8.13. He does not quote Hebrews 8.13. He cites it. You know what the difference between cite and quote? Quote means you quote it. The whole thing. Word for word. Cite means you put you put the reference there, but you don't quote it. You just leave people on their own responsibility to look up the reference. But Hebrews 8.13 is a crucial text. In Hebrews 8.1, Paul says, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. So he waits at chapter 8 to tell you the main point, okay? And verse 13 is a crucial verse. In Hebrews 8, he quotes, Jeremiah 31, on the change between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, Paul says, summarizing his argument from from Jeremiah 31, Paul says in Hebrews 8.13, in that he says a new covenant, so Jeremiah is looking forward to a new covenant, the new covenant that's going to come, okay? He's in the Old Covenant, he's uh, centuries before the coming of Christ, Jeremiah is, is looking forward to the new covenant, this coming new covenant. So, Paul summarizes it says, look, he said new, okay, get it, new. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, okay? Now, that's real easy. So, there was the old covenant and the new covenant. We are in the new covenant now. The first covenant is obsolete. Everybody agree with that? I mean, please, you got to agree with me on that one. The first covenant is obsolete. It says so in the Bible. I mean... I know it's not red letters, Jesus didn't say it, but still it's in the Bible. So, Paul says, in that he says a new covenant, he's made the first covenant obsolete. That's past tense. He's made the first covenant obsolete. But notice what he says. Now, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. There's a change of tense there. And the fact is, what he was pointing to is the transition between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. What he's saying is that the Old Covenant ceremonies are almost, but not quite, gone. Because people were still, at 67 AD, performing sacrifices. They were still obligated 
to do all the old covenant rituals. That was still in force. But he says, what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. So back then, in the last days of the old covenant, the old covenant ceremonies were passing away, but hadn't quite passed yet. In um, F.F. F. Bruce, commentary on, on Hebrews, he says, if the earlier covenant, with all that accompanied it, is antiquated, it is ready to vanish away. Anything that is old and aging will shortly disappear. He quotes the New English Bible there, I think. And he points out that this was written while the old temple was still standing. If, in fact, the Jerusalem temple was still standing, if the priests of Aaron's line were still discharging their sacrificial duties there, then our author's words were all the more telling. Jesus and shortly after him, Stephen, had foretold the downfall of the temple. If the end of the temple and its ministry had been imminent 30 years before, as Jesus and, and Stephen were saying, it was more imminent now that the 40 years of probation were more than three quarters of the way toward their end. So Jesus and Stephen were pointing to the destruction of the temple almost 40 years before. Now he's saying it's even more imminent, so it's all the more pressing on the readers of the of the Hebrews epistle. Back to Bonson. Remember, I said Greg Bonson four times refers to, he cites, but does not quote Hebrews 8.13. Let me read Hebrews 8.13 again. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. So that looks like it's all gone. But then, that is almost seems like it's contradicted by what he says next. Now what is becoming obsolete? Well, Paul, is it obsolete or isn't it? Which is it? One or the other, right? And that's what he says there is it's becoming obsolete. But it wasn't quite obsolete yet. Note what Bonson says. He is in heaven now, so I don't want to, you know, speak evil of the dead. But So I won't say he cheated, but it looks like he's cheating. On page 194 of The Anime and Christian Ethics, Bonson says, Hebrews 8.13 says that the old age is past, but the age of the sun is here to stay. And see, here we are living in 1997, and we read that and say, say, yeah, yeah, that's true. The old age is past. The new age is here to stay. But the problem is that's not what Hebrews 8.13 is saying. What Hebrews 8.13 is saying is it's passing away. Hadn't quite gone yet. Um, page 209 of Bonson's book. The ineffective priesthood has been superseded by the better hope. Hence, the ceremonial system is now antiquated. The perfect has come, thus making the sacrificial priestly temple irrelevant, Hebrews 8.13. The ceremonial system of the Old Covenant has become obsolete and grown old. It is aphanismos, which is the Greek word that means disappearing, which in its verbal form is used of legislation which becomes inoperative because it is no longer relevant to change circumstances. But the trouble is, he doesn't dare quote the actual verse. He'll quote it in Greek because people aren't reading Greek. Okay? But it was disappearing. It hadn't quite disappeared yet. So what he's doing is, he's saying, look, the Old Covenant is gone. We all agree the Old Covenant is gone. And that's the trick. I'm like downgrading him. I don't mean to do that. But the fact is, he's pulling a theological trick by getting you to agree to something. And you don't realize that the tremendous theological import of what you just gave away. Because Hebrews 8.13 does not say that the Old Covenant is obsolete. It says it's growing obsolete, becoming old, ready to vanish away. It's obsolete now in 1997. So we think, hey, cool, nothing wrong with that. Let me, let me go on. Let me quote Bonson again on page 213. I quoted that before. Remember, I gave that those five points. I'll just quote number three again. The observation of this system of ordinances, redemptive ceremonies, was intended to be superseded. It was a foreshadow of Christ's saving economy and has become obsolete with his historical work. Hebrews 8.13. Hebrews 8.13 says it has become obsolete. No, it doesn't. It says it is becoming obsolete. It was becoming obsolete as Paul was writing it. But it wasn't quite obsolete yet. Otherwise, if it was completely obsolete, he would have said so. But it wasn't yet. It certainly is obsolete now for us 
And so that's why we don't even think about the sort of psychological trick that has been conveyed in this. One more quote from Bonson, page 227. Um, the period of the Old Testament is now followed by the New. The kingdom has superseded the time of expectation, the Older Testamental era. The age of the law and prophets is past. The age of the Son and its fuller revelation is here to stay. What does he quote? Hebrews 8.13. What he's doing is, he's getting us to impute to Hebrews 8.13 something that Hebrews 8.13 never intended to mean. It doesn't mean that it's past. It means that it's past now for us, because we're past 70 AD. But it wasn't past yet. It was almost past. It was uh, like a hair's breadth from being past, but it wasn't quite past. An actual quotation would show that from the New Testament or last day's perspective, it hadn't quite passed yet. Bonson was perhaps unknowingly playing a theological sleight of hand trick. And at this point, let me um, make a little uh, suggestion. Let me give you a hint. If you're having trouble with preterism, look at it through a New Testament transitional language. For instance, Ephesians 2, from verse 19, I'll read the now, therefore, you, you being the Gentiles, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being joined together, grows, present tense, into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. It hadn't completely been built yet. It was growing. There's a transition going on in the New Testament that we often fail to recognize because we're so much past it now. It was a transition that was going on then, but is not going on now. It has been completed. Now, let me quote from John Brown, a commentator of the last century. 1754 to 1858, he wrote a book in three volumes called Discourses and Sayings of Our Lord. And he says something significant on page 171 and 172. He talks about the passing away of heaven and earth in Matthew 5, 17 through 19. And he takes the position that the passing of heaven and earth is past. We're not waiting for it to pass away someday. He takes the position that it is past. Boy, he's almost a preterist, isn't he? Now listen to this. If the words are carefully examined of Matthew 5, 17 through 19, they will be found to contain in them not an indefinite declaration of the inviolable authority of the law, but a declaration of its inviolable authority till a certain period, till certain events have taken place, till heaven and earth pass, till all things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth passing away understood literally as a dissolution of the present system of the universe, and the period when that is to take place is called the end of the world. But... He's saying, I don't agree with that. That's what people think it means. But a person at all familiar with the phraseology of the Old Testament scriptures knows that the dissolution of the Mosaic economy and the establishment of the Christian is often spoken of as the removal of earth and heaven and the creation of a new earth and heaven. For example, for behold, I create a new heaven and new earth, and former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. For as the new heavens and new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. He's quoting from Isaiah, Isaiah 65 and 66. The period of the close of one dispensation and the commencement of the other is spoken of as the last days and the end of the world and is described as a shaking of the earth and heavens as should lead to the removal of the things which were shaken. Now notice he's quoting from Haggai chapter 2 and from Hebrews chapter 12. That's very good. So far, that's excellent preterist exposition. The phrase in the end of the verse, till all things be fulfilled, seem to refer to the, to the typically prophetical character of the law and to be equivalent to till all things figured in it be, take place, really exist, till the true priest and the true altar and the true sacrifice come. In these words, there is an allusion to the language in the previous verse. Christ says, I am not come to destroy, that is to invalidate the Old Testament scriptures, but to complete them. Now, the period referred to is the period when divine revelation was completed by the Son of God. Stop. Okay? So far, he's preterist. I mean, he's preterist up to the hilt. Let me say that again. The period referred to is the period when divine revelation was completed by the Son of God. That period I apprehend was what? What would it be? 
if not 70 AD, when was Scripture finished? Remember, he says, the period when divine revelation was completed by the Son of God. When was divine revelation completed? He says, that period I apprehend was the pouring out of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Oops, wait a minute. Pentecost happened like 35 years before Paul wrote in Hebrews, saying that it's passing away. And he even quotes the footnote here is Hebrews 12, 26, and 27, which was written over 30 years after he says Revelation had stopped being given. If Revelation stopped on the day of Pentecost, none of the New Testament would exist. But the New Testament was written in the period of transition, in the last days period of transition from Old Covenant to New Covenant. So John Brown says that divine revelation was completed at Pentecost. But the fact is, the divine revelation wasn't even written yet at Pentecost. Like I said, he quotes Hebrews 12, 26, and 27, which was written over 30 years after Pentecost. What I'm trying to say, though, is his point is valid. John Brown's point is valid. He just had it off by a few years. As applied to the closing of the canon in A.D. 70, when the temple was destroyed by God's own judgment, his point is valid. Let me read a couple pages of Paradox of George to make my point. This is from page 103 and following. One of my favorite statements in Paradise of George. Because Jerusalem apostatized and refused to be synagogued under Christ, her temple would be destroyed and a new synagogue and temple would be formed, the church. The new temple was created, of course, on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit came to indwell the church. But the fact of the new temple's existence would only be made obvious when the scaffolding of the old temple and the old covenant system was taken away. The Christian congregations immediately began calling themselves synagogues, that is the word used in James 2, 2 while calling the Jewish gatherings synagogues of Satan, Revelation 2, 9, 3, 9. Yet they lived in anticipation of the day of judgment upon Jerusalem and the old temple, when the church would be revealed as the true temple and synagogue of God. Because the old covenant system was obsolete and ready to disappear, Hebrews 8.13, the writer to the Hebrews urged them to have hope, not forsaking the synagoguing of ourselves together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more so as you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10.25. The Old Testament promised that God would synagogue his people and undergoes one major change in the New Testament. Instead of the simple form of the word, the term used by Jesus as the Greek preposition epi prefix to it. This is a favorite New Covenant expression which intensifies the original word. What Jesus is saying, therefore, is that the destruction of the temple in AD 70 will reveal himself as having come with clouds to receive his kingdom, and it will display his church before the world as the full, the true, the super synagogue. Now that stands as almost complete, complete preterist statement. I mean, I have no problem with that. And I wrote at the beginning of the front page of my book a quotation from Alexander Pope. A man should never be ashamed to own he has been in the wrong, which is but saying, in other words, that he is wiser today than he was yesterday. Now, like Paul said in Hebrews, let me get to the point. Let me cut to the chase here. The literalist theonomous dilemma is that Bonson says every bit of the old law, Old Testament law, is binding until heaven and earth are literally gone. That means the Old Testament ceremonies, too. That means the dietary laws, too. And I happen to know Bonson loved pork and shellfish. He also liked jello. By the way, ever read the ingredients of jello? You know what it says on the box? Ingredients, gelatin. Well, that tells me a lot, right? Look up gelatin in the dictionary. You know what gelatin says? Boiled animal skin, bones, and tissue. As Bill Cosby would say, there's always room for horses, though. <laughs> My point is that the dietary rules are a major issue in the New Testament. In the New Covenant, you still go to heaven if, if you eat pork. Maybe you might go a little quicker. <laughs> The point of the New Testament is that detailed elements of the Old Covenant were still binding until A.D. 70. The sacrifices and ceremonies weren't passed for Paul's readers. They were passing away. Matthew 5, 17 through 19 looks like it will happen in one fell swoop. In reality, it was a transition. Paul rebukes the Galatians for their Old Covenant legalism in Galatians 4, um, 3, and 9 and 10. In 
Galatians 4, 3, and 9 and 10, and Colossians 2, 8, and 20 and 21, and Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, in those texts, Paul specifically talks about the elements of the Old Covenant. The, the Greek word is stoicheia. The elements of the Old Covenant system that were passing away, that were becoming obsolete. And he's rebuking them for following the elements of the Old Covenant legalism instead of for going to the New Covenant freedom. In all the Greek word there is stoicheia, and when we get to Second Peter 3, all the dispensationalist world are saying, well, elements, they go back to ancient Greek and they say, well, in ancient Greek, it means, it means what the earth is made of. It means, uh, the physical particles, the physical elements of the, the earthly world. And so therefore, that's what Second Peter 3 is talking about. It's talking about the complete vanishing away of, of literal heaven and earth. But the passing of heaven and earth that the Bible speaks about is not ever literally the passing away of the literal gravel, sand, rock, heaven and earth. It has nothing to do with that. The new world order of the Lord Jesus Christ has arrived, and according to God's promise, the saving knowledge of him will fill the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen. Thank you very much.